I'm Andy Mayo, Operations Director at Armadillo Managed Services. Thanks very much for joining us today. Before we move into the webinar, I'd like to give you all a, a brief introduction to Armadillo. Um, we, as a solutions company, have been partnering with market-leading and innovative vendors since 2001, um, delivering information security to our clients. We've got a comprehensive portfolio of solutions that optimise people's business processes, reduce risk and deliver resiliency for our clients. These clients span across all industries and scale from SMB to global enterprises. Um, particularly, we pride ourselves on, on our knowledge of the global um, cyber industry. Um, we've been the first company to introduce new and disruptive technologies to the UK market over the years, such as Palo Alto and FireEye, um, and we're continually researching um, new technologies that we will bring into the UK uh, in the future. Um, but beyond this technology, um, we focus on consultancy, uh, particularly the human aspects, and working closely with our clients, um, advising on how to reduce the exposure to risk, and allowing them to actually focus on their core business. Um, so why did we organize this webinar? Well, we wanted to introduce you to uh, a couple of companies who are leaders in the field of combating damaging cyber activity uh, through the employee interaction with data and applications, um, which could potentially lead to data leakage and uh, loss of company IP. Um, we all know this isn't necessarily malicious behaviour. It's often just ignorance from the employee. Um, and so pretty much we need to ensure that our users are armed with the knowledge and that they need to limit that impact, their actions, on our businesses. So before we dive in, uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we move on. Um, if I can ask you please to mute all phones, we will attempt to do this um, centrally if we can. Um, and if you do have any questions as we go through, please save them until the end. Uh, we'll actually have a question and answer session. Um, or the chat function at the top of the screen um, where you can type in your questions um, to be picked up during the presentation. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is hand over to Melanie Oldham, MD of Bob's Business, to give you an overview of her company. My name is Melanie Oldham um, and I'm founder and managing director of, of Bob's Business. Uh, we're uh, an information cybersecurity awareness training company, so we teach people uh, best practice principles of ISO 20. 1001 data protection. Uh, we have a, a suite of, of training materials that are designed to change user behavior. The best way to, to change user behavior is obviously uh, to try and give them the information they need in the format they do that. So we have a range of products and services um, that can help hopefully meet those needs. So I'm hoping today to give you a bit of an insight as to how we believe we achieve behavioural change with the organisations that we work with and give you some top tips on how, how you can replicate that in your organisation and deliver effective awareness campaigns. So basically, following on from the corporate overview, thanks very much for um, bearing with those, two of them anyway, and we didn't quite, <laughs> quite get on to the third one. Um, we'll move into the webinar content. Um, so to start with, traditionally, as we all know, an organisation's approach to enforcing security has been by implementing technology solutions. Um, and today's environment, these are proving less effective uh, as threats evolve. And again, we're all aware that uh, this traditional perimeter um, that we've had no longer exists. Data now resides in a multitude of devices, in a multitude of locations, um, you know, cloud, mobile devices, phones, tablets, etc. Um, to add this to in this increased vulnerability, users have become familiar with using their consumer applications on their phones, tablets, etc., sharing files, data, photographs with friends, families. So when they get to their work environment, this is pretty much normal practice. So they generally don't think twice about sharing any company data um, on these platforms or opening emails from unknown sources um, that could potentially compromise their device. For companies, I mean, the consequences of this compromise could be absolutely devastating, not least you know, possibly regulatory fines, um, but more importantly, obviously, the loss of business um, through brand reputation loss, um, because clients and partners tend no longer to trust you to do business with. We've seen this um, with, with many of the uh, pre breaches that have come recently. 
Um, again, technology can only go so far to protect you, which is why Armadillo, um, we continue researching new approaches to mitigate existing and new threat vectors that emerge. Um, through this, we, we realized a while ago that the human element was often overlooked, and there was a lack of awareness in the marketplace, um, and particularly clients that we talk to uh, on a regular basis around user education. Um, and it's actually been coming out to reinforce this in, in the media um, fairly recently as well over, over the last few months, but, uh, how important this is. I mean, this is, this is when we started to look for partners that would help us fill this gap in our portfolio um, and assist our clients um, with their um, issues in this area. So following, following some due diligence done by Armadillo, we, we selected Bob's Business and Fish5 um, as partners. Um, cause we instantly recognized the synergy between the two companies um, and what we were looking to achieve. Um, and, what, and what we believe is, we, we truly believe we've come up with um, a complementary solution now that, that's become a necessary addition to your security arsenal to address risk introduced by this human element. Um, and, to, and to lead into uh, the webinar and, and Melanie's content, um, I'll hand you over to Melanie again. Um, hopefully following Melanie, um, we'll, we'll get Ray. Um, but many will start with talking about uh, the human factors um, and how to uh, educate your users uh, and the impact of those factors on your information security. And again, following Melanie, if we're lucky, Ray at Fish5 will discuss with you in depth the reasons why we need to engage with educating those employees and the need to reinforce that education. Melanie? That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Andy. So the thing that was touched on there is that, you know, uh, the biggest threat to information security is is ourselves. It's us. Um, as I just to give you a bit of background, my background is marketing, project management and everything people related. So uh, I've chosen from the various different ports to have 95 percent of IT security breaches being the, the primary uh, being caused by human error. Obviously, from a marketing perspective, you always work pick the one that works best for you. So that's where why we've got such a high one. But it's, it's really reflective in so many reports. It's always us, uh, which is in itself very worrying, considering that we are the frontline defenders of the information and the data that we hold. Um, the problem that exists with us as, as, as people is that unlike technology, we, we're driven by emotions. So therefore, we can't be uh, fixed, patched, um, or monitored. And that in there lies, lies the problem. So um, I work with a, a host of organizations, whether they be small or larger um, local authority organizations, larger corporations. And continually, I always hear that information security training is failing. And there are a number of reasons for, it, for its failure. Um, mostly, people say they don't have the time to one, implement a good training course, um, but also two, people don't have the time to complete it. They are too busy doing their day-to-day -day job, which is generally generating money for their organization. So that's the first barrier is I don't have time. The second one is, oh, it's not my role, it's not my responsibility, I just don't, you know, this is, this is outside my scope. I'm brought in to do this job. Information security is an issue that sits with IT team. Uh, so there's the general that. There's also the element of who, who, me? Information security affects me. How does it affect me? And people just generally have that lack of understanding regarding information security. The other thing with information security ultimately is what you're trying to achieve is behavioral change. And as a general rule, people are resistant to change. So you've got a lot of things going against you before you even start. Uh, typically, engagement with, with um, e-learning in particular, uh, but awareness courses is really, really low. You're talking around the 10 to 15 percent. Uh, we managed to get engagement statistics with the clients that we work with in excess of 90. Um, and I'm hoping to give you some tips and some clues as to how you can achieve that within your organization. Uh, the general full, uh, view of HR professionals is that the, the major challenge organizations in the future with this very, very technically orientated world is that uh, employee engagement is going to be the biggest challenge and I can certainly sort of confirm that from the conversations with the clients I've had. There's another uh, common um, sorry, uh, misconception and that fear is an enabler to information security in that if you actually scare people enough, 
it will change their behaviors. And to a degree, I, I, I can semi-relate. As, as a business owner, I would say yes, definitely. Um, if you were to, to tell me how much um, money I was going to lose, the impact that it would have on my reputation, then definitely it would potentially change my behaviors. But to an employee, they're somewhat removed from that. It, it's, it's not their money that they're playing with. It's not necessarily their reputation that's going to be damaged. Um, and on the contrary, if you actually um, try to give uh, employees information in a negative way, it can have, um, sorry, in, in a sort of a fearful way, it can have really negative ramifications. They sort of batten down the hatches. They're more controlled in what they do. They're, they're worried about using elements of technology that are there to enable and enhance their jobs. And they become somewhat de uh, detached because they have that fear element. And the easiest way to get rid of fear is to, is to push it once on one side. So I would certainly say that from an information security perspective, using fear as an enabler is, is, is not a great tool. Um, so the question is, how do we achieve positive change and deliver information that employees uh, relate to? Um, and that, again, coming back to the fact that we are, we are human, we're driven by emotions, and we all have different emotions and handle different circumstances in different ways. Um, so it's important to find out what, what drives each of us. As a general rule, people don't do things with malicious intent. They don't do things to cause harm or cause damage. Yes, you get a, a small proportion of, of, um, of people that will do this because there's, there's money to be had. But on the whole, your employees, who are the biggest threat to your information security in infrastructure, don't want to, to cause harm. They're doing things because they're being too nice. Um, they are wanting to, to share passwords with colleagues because they've got that element of trust. They're wanting to share information uh, with people because they want to Im improve their productivity. The reasons for sending emails to their personal email address is because they're finding they've not got enough hours in the day to do the work um, in the nine to five hours. So they don't, but they're not thinking about whether or not they're sending it an unsecure email. They're not thinking about whether or not the laptop they're using at home has updated software. They're not thinking about whether or not there's encryption on there. They're just thinking, yeah, I need to get this job done. I want to do it efficiently, and therefore I can, I can make my time up at home. They're not thinking about the, the consequences of, of loss of data may have. They don't think when they're sending that information home that my customer potentially um, you know, it could cause them personal damage. It could cause loss of reputation, loss of data for the organization. So that's not what's going through their heads. So it's, it's trying to work out, okay, what drivers, what information do we, do we have to be able to change that behavior? How can we use the, the fact that people like people in order to change their behavior and give them information security? Um, one thing that I think it's important sort of to tell you, as I say, I come from very much a, a, a hospitality people marketing background. That's where I sort of started out my career and then have spent the last 10, 15 years sitting amongst IT professionals. And as a general rule, uh, you do speak a, uh, they do speak a different language. And I think that's one of, one of the, the biggest issues that we have with information security is that it sits within an IT team who have a slightly different language, slightly different approach to people. And people feel that information security, therefore, is something that's potentially far more complicated than it is. So I've got five simple steps in order to help you implement um, an effective awareness campaign that ultimately can change your user behavior and help you to develop a secure culture. Um, I've got an acronym for you because you all love acronyms, and that's YES SIR. So it's uh, spelled S-S-E-R-R. -R. So my first F in SIR would be to keep it simple. Try to think of information security from an end user point of view. Strip out any unnecessary jargon. What do they actually need to know? Do they need to know the standards? Don't keep it too long, keep it short, keep it concise. For people learning, they don't learn from hour long training courses. Uh, you know, you're limited to 10, 15 minutes max of actual learning if you want people to actually retain that information. So try to keep things concise. Try to think, do, do things in a drip feed manner. Uh, we we approach things in a modular manner, which works really, really well for, for the majority of our clients. And it's just, therefore, you're delivering information about information uh, security in a consistent approach on a regular basis. And that's how you achieve an element of behavioral change. But obviously, you also need to get people onto uh, the awareness. You need to get that material in front of them. And uh, the social side of it, the social influencing is, is, is key. So people talk about you need to have uh, management commitment and you need to have leadership in order for information security to work. And I completely agree with that, but it's more from showing to be leading in the way, showing examples. If incidents happen with a 
senior management, if a senior manager was actually fell foul to a phishing attack, their story shared with the employees in the organization to show that they're human, to show that, you know, we all fall for these pitfalls is really, really valuable and really effective in an awareness campaign. I know people won't be kind of comfortable necessarily putting their head out there, but from an end user point of view, from your employee's point of view, the respect, the guidance and the, the assurance that yes, they're not alone is, is really, really effective. And as a general rule, human, it's human nature to follow others. So if you're delivering a campaign and you're wanting everybody to, to, to complete that campaign, by pushing out on masses as a, a far more in, uh, greater impact than doing it into little silos and into individual units to try and think about delivering things on mass because you're more likely to get uh, commitment and, uh, and involvement in that. Um, the other thing to sort of concentrate on is the, the engaging side. Um, try to make any campaign that you do as engaging, as entertaining as possible. Try to use an element of storytelling. Try to use an element of creative writing. Competition, everybody loves competition and that comes back to the former point about uh, the uh, social influencing. People have a, a natural ability to be quite competitive. So if you can do competitions between departments of who are the best security advocates within your organization, then you're more likely to get people involved. If you can actually do a, a, a prize incentive of, of winning, in our instance, like Bob Gifts. So do people really want to do training because there's a chance of winning a Bob Gift? Absolutely. It's no different from why do people buy um, house insurance and car insurance? It's because they want a cuddly toy. And, be, you know, no matter what, what walk of life, people do things because they think they might get a reward and incentive at the end. That may be something as little as just having a certificate, having recognition that they can then put on their social media profiles, even just congratulating them, congratulating them for completing it on a mass scale. That has a real impact. Um, apparently, the more that we, that we laugh, the more information that we engage, uh, the more information that we retain. So if you can find out of, of humor, um, you know, we love and we push the passwords are like pants theory because, you know, you, you change them regularly, you don't share them. And, and again, anything that's got that element of, of, of rudeness about it is really, really effective for getting people to remember and it has those hooks in there. So that's the, the, the fun theory. And the fun theory, if you were to, to search it up on the internet and this element of edutainment, which is combining education with entertainment, maximizes engagement of, you know, you're talking going from 10% to 60%, 70% just by making that element of enjoyment in there. Okay. Um, make it relevant. So thinking about people are different and people do learn things in different ways. So although animations may work for, for some people, some people are still text so making sure you've got different mediums for delivering that information, but also making sure that you can tie it and align it to people's personal uh, values. So when you're pushing out a campaign and you can give an example and a case study of how that might impact the organization, think about how it can impact the individual as well. Think of case uh, examples of breaches that are similar that might happen within their home environment because people are more likely to understand it and appreciate it if they think that they can actually help and support their families and therefore protect protect their own personal lives. Uh, try to keep things as, as scenario based as possible. If people can actually see themselves falling for that breach, falling for that incident, then they're more likely to change their behaviors. Um, the next one is you, you don't embark on anything without having a, a clear set of objectives and your information security awareness should be no different. Uh, you don't send a product to market without marketing it without marketing it first, without finding what is its key selling points, without creating a brand, without setting objectives, uh, objectives of how you're going to get people to buy that product. And your security awareness shouldn't be any different. It's very much about breaking it down into bites and chunks of what you're hoping to achieve, giving it a brand, giving it a feel. Um, the learning behind this is that if, if if you can identify, if you can see tools, whether that be posters, screen displays, web banners, anything along those lines that have a similar look and feel, your brain in instantly links those pieces together. So therefore, you're building up um, a subconscious amount of information by putting key uh, learning points across different mediums, but having that same look and feel, and your brain pulls it all together and can associate that with your communication and your information security awareness plan. Um, by ad adding elements of, of games, of quizzes, of competition, it's, it's the fun element, but also that's, that's reinforcement. You're re 
reinforcing the key learning points. And again, the more that you can reinforce things, the more likely you are to have behavior change. It's no different from, you know, you set out and you have, you might have some, have your kids and they don't instantly know to clean, clean their teeth, but you tell them every day. And if you're telling people every day about sharing their passwords, eventually that message will embed in and it'll become part of your, your organizational culture. Okay, I'll come, I, I can answer this as they come in. I, I have no problems, um, but I'm just conscious that I'll go on to raise. But is it expensive? No, um, it, it isn't expensive because a lot of the tools that we can do, we have a, you know, we've been doing this for a number of years now, so we will give you a, an effective a marketing plan. Information security teams do not have uh, much in terms of budget and much in terms of resource. So we make sure that we give you basically all the tools that you need in order to implement, implement that marketing plan. So we will give you a communication plan that we will sit down and work with you. We will give you the online resources and the offline resources so that you can just push them out through your communication channels. So everything that, that's there, we, we can do for you. So it doesn't need to be resource or uh, cost intensive either. So thank you for that question. Um, okay. and. So they're, the, they're my five top tips. So it's keeping it simple, using social, um, and making sure you're making the most of your, the social influencing and the fact that people like people. And the next element, obviously, keeping it engaging, trying to make sure that people have a reason to want to do that. Um, keeping it relevant, so make sure you're tying it into personal um, principles as well as organizational policy and then finally making sure that you do that reinforcement so trying to push as, push those messages out in as many ways as possible i hope that helps so i'm going to now hand over to ray to say okay what is the problem that we're trying to to combat against okay so fishing i guess most participants are well aware of the term fishing so broadly speaking uh, it really originates back in the days when the Nigerian the 419 scam. Um, so when we had the 419 scam, of course, we had a situation where every man and his dog would get an email saying that they had um, just come into the opportunity of $50 million. And all they needed to do was to put 25,000 US into the sender's bank account. That was the, that was the dreaded 419 scam, which ran all worldwide. So that's really to tr that then moved on to tricking recipients into opening attachments, uh, which could have a malware embedded, uh, or it could be submitting credentials, or it could be directing them to a website which was um, hosting a malicious code or further information. So that, that, that's the broad, um, the broad statement on, on phishing uh, as a generic statement. If we look at spear phishing, broadly the aims are the same, but we're now into a world of extremely sophisticated and targeting attacks. The criminals, um, and let's make no mistake about this, they are criminals. They are international cyber criminals, um, and they will, depending on what they're trying to achieve, whether it's to steal uh, your company's IP, your organization's IP, whether it's to get a hold of people's um, bank account details or email addresses or profiles, they will dig through social networks, they'll go through the websites, they'll read newspapers, they'll make contacts with people in your organization who may unwittingly give them further information. And so eventually what will happen is a targeted email will arrive on your desk looking like a legitimate trusted uh, mail from a trusted source. And of course, I, I guess Melanie would already have covered the some of the psychological aspects. It preys on people's trust. Uh, it preys on their sense of wishing to do well, wishing to be part of the team. And so they will respond. And 90% of the time, 95% of the time, they will, they, will, um, they will take the lure. So what I'd like to now look at is this aspect of no one being safe. Now, the reason I've just put five organizations up here is to give you a sense of the spread of the, the attacks from the cyber criminal fraternity, whether it be highly political, 
such as the probably the attack on um, Barack Obama was at the beginning of the year, um, getting into him, getting into his emails, uh, or whether it be financial, based on those two massive attacks into Target and Home Depot. For those of you who are not aware, these two major attacks, uh, high-profile attacks, occurred in the USA at the beginning. It was actually December 2013. And it, uh, the net effect was that Target, the cost to Target was something like $150 million. And uh, that's in direct cost. The CEO was fired. The CIO was fired. Um, and the financial numbers are still being worked because there's a number of, of um, lawsuits which are outstanding. And there's massive amounts of money that have got to be sorted out in the banking world. Home Depot, there was 2,200 stores hacked. Similar story. We all know about the Sony Pictures because every, all the superstars were um, up front and centre and all the mass media telling us about how their uh, private negotiations and private contracts have been, um, have been disrupted. Then we get another scary one, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a premier defence organization. How come they can get hacked? Well, they did. That was in Wales in October 2014. So what we end up with is a situation that we then get to who is the Chartered Institute for Securities. <clears throat> so we then look at the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investment. Now, you might say, who is that? Because it's a relatively small organization, highly specialized. They are a London institution. Now, you might say, well, why would someone attack a small organization like that? Well, guess what? 40,000 members of that institute. And you've got to think that all those men and women are in pretty sensitive positions, either within the treasury departments, certainly within the financial sector and the investment sector. Now, no one knows why they were tight. We can only um, speculate. But I think it's reasonably, it would, be, it would be reasonably just speculation to think that some, if not all, of those men and women are, on, are in the gun sites uh, of the criminals who made the attack. The final comment on this particular slide. One of the possible dangers we have here in the UK is we don't hear an awful lot about breaches. And that is because only 14% are actually publicly declared. That is going to change as EU legislation currently going through. This, it may happen this year, um, but it is going to force uh, breaches to be reported within a given number of days, 21 days or whatever it might be. Um, and we can expect to see a massive uptick on the number of public breaches that are being made, being made available. It's, it would be naive to think that because we're not getting the same level of public knowledge in the UK, that we are not getting the same level of attacks in the US. It is happening. It is only the only thing that's not being reported. So if we go on, we we'll look at a, a recent survey by PwC. PwC was commissioned by the UK government to carry out this survey. And quite astoundingly, look at those figures, 90% of large businesses and 70% of smaller ones surveyed, they experienced cybersecurity attacks in 2014. 90% of large businesses. It's, it's, we've got to think that that is typical throughout the whole of the UK. That just demonstrates the degree of under-reporting that is actually happening in the UK. If you look at the cost of the, the, the breach to the business, now this cost involves reputational damage, it involves remediation, it involves many factors, offline, cost to business and so forth. But the PwC numbers, the cost per breach to the SME is between £75,000 and £311,000 per breach. To the large organisations, between one and a half to 3.14. Uh, very, very substantial numbers by by PwC. Now, 
you might ask, well, why are we looking at the Verizon global breach statistics? Well, I think this again is just to demonstrate the, what is happening globally. And what is happening globally, I repeat, repeat myself here, is, is most likely happening here as well. It involves, this, this, uh, these breach statistics involved a global 61 different countries. And all of the major um, cyber security organizations, whether it be the US Secret Service, uh, whether it be the FBI, whether it be CERT UK, EU, whether it be Canadians or the Malaysians, the whole list, 70 different organizations all over the world. An interesting figure there was that 70% of attacks, attacks included a secondary victim. I would like just to refer back to the comment about the Institute um, for Chartered Securities and Investors, 40,000 uh, members, their information stolen. You have got to think that the reason for that attack was to identify secondary victims, whether it be an indiv one individual, a number of individuals, or a, a particular organization. Secondary attacks. So the supply chain becomes an area of serious concern in those organizations which have extensive supply chains, many vendors coming into them. The other aspect from the Verizon, the, the breach report, people say, well, won't my AV protect me? Won't my, uh, my defense, perimeter defense check? It will not. All of these technologies rely on getting the latest signature information from the various vendors globally. And if we look at the, the, the rapidity of getting those new signatures down onto your systems in time, it's highly unlikely that they're going to stop a target attack. 82 seconds from the start of a phishing attack to the first email being opened. And a 90% chance that at least one person will become that phishing criminal's prey. And that's all it requires. One person and they're in. And it may even happen that you don't even notice it because it's done in a manner whereby a certain amount of maybe malware is put into your environment without knowing it's there. And then maybe a couple of days later, a couple of hours, a couple of weeks later, another one, and maybe a couple of minutes, a couple of days, a couple of, another one. And so they take control unbeknown to you all through phishing mails. The reason that we put this vulnerability growth rate on is just to demonstrate the rate at which vulnerabilities are occurring. In the last year alone, there's been a 32% increase on the number of vulnerabilities. Now, this encompasses such as the Microsoft platform, the Oracle platform, the Adobe platform, and so forth. And this is growing because what happens as the, as the software developers, the vendors, are, are in a race to bring new technology to the market, sometimes, not always, but sometimes they may just get some components which were, which were um, solid six months ago, nine months ago, a year ago. Now there may be a problem. But now it gets incorporated, it gets put into the market, and before you know it, we've got more compromises. Our technology, our service, the Fish5 service, not only handles the phishing aspect, but also checks uh, and reports. On the same reporting system, it reports on browser and plugin uh, issues. One of the other issues that we find occurs is that senior management, line management, often question, how, how can we, how can we uh, prove or justify this? Well. In many ways, people will argue it's like insurance. If you don't, you know, we all have insurance for our homes. We all have insurance for our cars. Um, so it's a form of insurance. But guess what? Aberdeen Group, which is a, a large internationally recognised group, they did a study, and they have proven conclusively that click rates will fall dramatically. Breaches will fall dramatically if the proper approach is taken, such as what we are recommending here within this seminar. I think that's me done, Melanie. Thank you. <laughs> Lovely.
So I'll just quickly quickly move on because I'm conscious that we've got sort of left uh, not very long for the wrap up. So the the question is so so what can we do to help you? Um, as I touched on um, from from our perspective, fear is not an enabler to to information security awareness and it has more of a negative fact and one of the arguments that comes across is that by phishing in its very nature is testing people and potentially threatening them in terms of um, making them feel threatened because they're feeling tested and they're feeling understood. Um, but the thing that we are uh, keen to sort of say to you in terms of a solution is that we can do a two-pronged attack so we can combine awareness uh, with the phishing campaign. So that is actually giving people the tools, the understanding about um, how to identify a phishing tool so that they are actually being seen as advocates for the organization. So it's a more positive experience than a punitive one. So they're actually seeing how they can help. They know what's about to come, what's about to happen to them and what to look out for. So you're not trying to, 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 to trick people. What you're trying to do is, is, is get trust, get them to be able to think before they click and actually try and change their behaviours. So the, the purpose of the campaign is that you deliver the, the, the tools, you deliver the understanding and then you test test that understanding. Um, and then for those people that need it, you provide additional training. So you're giving targeted training to those people that fall foul of those phishing scams. So you're giving some awareness to start off with. Then you're doing the, the, the testing element and then pushing you back. When we go on the social side of this, when people, sort of, when people say, okay, but how, do, how is that received in-house? In you know, people have social forums now, so when, when attack happens, aren't people reporting on them? And to a degree, y yes, social media does move quite, qu quite quickly, although we can move quickly. There is that element of, of getting that understanding with an organization that this, this, this is actually happening. But people talking about it, good or bad, has a really positive way. And I've got some, some great stories if anybody wants to hear those at a, at a later date. So it's that two, two that sort of three, three steps. The first one is to, to give the, the information and the tools. The second one is to test their understanding. And then the third one is to, to do that reinforcement. So repeating those tacks. Uh, offering further training, further support, and basically the complexity of, of the, the spear, spear phishing. So that's how we're looking at combining awareness training um, with, uh, with elements of, of, of phishing to make it, as I say, a positive experience rather than a, a punitive one. So just in summary, what we're saying is if you've got good awareness and good communication um, and you combine that with a phishing simulation exercise and you can reinforce those, those key messages, and ultimately, that's a, a great way of achieving behavioral change and therefore securing your organization. And that's pretty much a, a wrap from my point of view. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, if you would like to know more um, and you would like to uh, look at taking up a trial um, of the two solutions um, that we've just gone through here, um, Please make contact with us. We will obviously be um, following up with all the attendees to get some feedback on today's session. Feel free to feed feedback, um, whatever whatever you would like.